Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this skill session on how to use data to advocate for gender equality and the sustainable development goals. We are thrilled to have you join us today. Uh, my name is Arushi. Uh, and I work as a regional coordinator for Asia for Equal Measures 2030, hosted at the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center on Women, an organization that works on advocating for sexual and reproductive health and rights. I am currently based out of India. Along with me today are my colleagues, Sassi and Helen. Uh, I would request them to introduce themselves. Sassi, would you like to go first? Thank you, Arushi. My name is uh, Cecilia Garcia. I am the Regional Coordinator for Latin America and the Caribbean of EM Equal Measures 2030, hosted um, in the Latin American and the Caribbean Committee for the Defense of Women's Rights, a feminist network working across 15 countries in Latin America. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, Ceci and Arushi. Uh, my name is Helen Apila. Um, I'm the Regional Coordinator for Equal Measures 2030 uh, for Africa. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hosted by the African Women's uh, Communication and Development Network, FEMNET, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Great, thank Over you so you. much. Thank you so much, Helen and Sassi. Um, welcome, everybody. Before we start, um, I thought I could spend a couple of minutes talking to you about what you can expect to learn by the end of our engagement today. We hope that by the end of this session, you would feel more comfortable using gender data in your advocacy. We hope that this session will help you understand how to use gender data from the sustainable develop uh, and use gender data from the uh, SDG gender index to create compelling advocacy messages that can inspire action for gender equality and the SDGs in your region and context. There, we all know that there is opportunity for data to be integrated at every stage of the advocacy cycle. Um, at the session today, you will hear directly from advocates from across regions on how they use gender data to amplify their advocacy and achieve their objectives. Um, we encourage you to submit your questions and reflections through the Q&A function on Zoom. We have budgeted for time towards the end of the session, and we'll try to respond to all of, our question, all of your questions to the best of our ability. Uh, we will also try to respond to them in the chat function itself. Um, I will now hand over to my uh, colleague, Helen, to initiate um, the poll function. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, we we are going to do um, a poll. Do you want to whatever your screen and share? Great. So our poll question. Our poll question today. Uh, Question number one is looking at, at what capacity have you been involved in, in actions uh, to advance the sustainable development goals? And you have questions there. Please go ahead and just give your answers. Uh, but quickly, you can see uh, from the responses um, that we already have uh, uh, the highest uh, uh, number of participants uh, using uh, doing research around SDGs. Um, followed, we also have um, participants who are doing direct advocacy uh, around uh, the deliverables and targets within the SDG. And um, this is followed closely by raising awareness uh, around the sustainable development goals. Um, we can also see a great number of participants who are actually involved in organizational communication around SDGs. Um, I'll give one more minute and then we will end the poll and be able to, to move forward. So one minute to our uh, participants. So still our results are showing that uh, the highest number of participants are using um, are involved at the level of research and they are still followed by those who do direct advocacy around the targets and commitments. Um, 
raising awareness. Um, I think the lowest scores uh, range between funding and media outlets. A good number are also involved in training around SDGs. Um, so we have a good mix of participants at this stage. So I would like to end the poll um, so that we can, we, can, we can move on to the next poll. I can share the results now. And you see the results there. So from there, you can still see that uh, the, the leading number of participants are researchers. Uh, we have those who raise awareness and then also uh, followed by advocates. Um, so you're welcome. I invite Ceci, Cecilia to take us to the next poll. Thank you, Helen. So we continue to learn a bit about you, our audience. So we have a second polling question. Um, can we show it? Um, so do you regularly use gender data in your work to advance the sustainable development goals? Here we just have three options. Yes, no, or if you're unsure about this question, you also have that option. Um, and while you answer, apologies if it, this polling question is not showing for all the participants, maybe it's a technical issue, but we will share the results out loud uh, with the audience that is also joining, um, not on the Zoom um, platform, but on the festival platform. Okay, so this is a short one. Maybe we can show the results now if you have had time <laughs> to answer the question. Okay, so we see here that we have a, a, a great percentage of participants that have used gender data in their work. Uh, so hopefully um, the, all of the participants, uh, the ones that said no and are unsure if they have used gender data in their work, will learn about the tool that we are going to share with you today. Um, to, um, to use it in your day-to-day uh, -day work around the SDGs. Uh, but thank you for participating in this, uh, in this polling questions. Back to you, uh, Arushi. Thank you so much, Sassi and Helen. It's great to see um, that we have um, so many participants who've engaged in research and advocacy and have some comfort in using gender data. And um, I, uh, I hope and I believe that the conversation today would be useful for everyone um, as uh, we would spend some time um, introducing you to the SDG Gender Index. Um, Anusha, can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so the SDG Gender Index is, um, it is the most comprehensive index on gender equality aligned to uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. The index includes 51 gender sensitive indicators across 14 of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and it covers 129 countries across the world. Each goal is covered by three to five indicators. These issues include both official indicators, uh, from the SDG framework and complementary indicators that capture other important dimensions of gender equality. The SDG Gender Index is um, the Equal Measures 2030 flagship tool. Um, it was shaped by, um, it was first introduced in 2019. And it was shaped by uh, collaboration across several partner organizations a, across seven countries, as well as through dialogue with thousands of other stakeholders worldwide. Uh, the SDG Gender Index and uh, why we speak to you about it today is because it's uh, because of the nature of the index, it's relevant, it's comprehensive, um, it is policy focused, it is aligned to the SDG framework, and it is very easy to use. Um, so we hope to be able to spend uh, the next couple of minutes introducing you to the index and telling you a little bit more about how the data has been uh, packaged in the index and can be used uh, by you all in your advocacy around uh, and other work around the sustainable development goals. Um, next slide, please. Over to you. So this uh, heat map shows the big picture at a glance uh, where we can quickly identify how the 129 countries included in the SDG gender index are performing. 
Um, and and this, um, this heat map is based on the overall gender index scores for these 129 countries. Uh, these scores has, are based on a scale of zero to 100. The closer countries are uh, to, the, to, the, to the 100 score, they are performing better. Uh, the closer they are to the zero and the red, um, they are performing worse in the goals and indicators that the index looks at. So this is a, the big picture at a glance. Um, Um, great. Um, so uh, uh, we would like to share with you how we have been able to use um, the, 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 the SDG gender index data in our work. And these are just examples of what we have done in the last uh, two years since the launch of the index. So advocates have been able to use um, this data that we extract from the index for, for several uh, sustainable development goals indicators to frame the advocacy issues when they are having dialogues with governments, with private sector, and the key policymakers, even with donors. So it depends on the context where you're engaging with, 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 with the data and, and the policymakers. Um, advocates have also used this uh, specific data um, to benchmark uh, performance of countries in, within the policy uh, framework. For example, we have simplified this information into uh, very simple information like brief policy briefs, and we've done fact sheets for countries, uh, and we've used this to engage and make it very simple to access and use in any any advocacy platform where you're engaging. We have created uh, uh, gender data dashboards, uh, which draw a lot of data from this index, from the indicators, but also data from the national statistics that is available uh, from government institutions like. Um, the National Bureaus of Statistics. So this data has been put together, comp compiled and simplified, visualized in the most simplest forms for any ordinary uh, advocate or person or a communicator could be a media person to use and access. We have also used this data to inspire uh, new conversations uh, with, with, um, with, with, in, with civil society organizations and other actors at the national level. And we've done this um, in, in countries like Colombia and India. And when you have data, you speak, uh, you speak about the stories with, with, with authority and it's authentic. We have also used the index and, and the data to train and build capacity of journalists, specifically to use this data, to be able to write um, stories and, and have them published stories that that it add value you know, to, the, to the conversation, but also that raise awareness about the key issues in India and Kenya. So basically there is a wide range of, of, of ways you can use this data, depending on your context, you can contextualize it based on your need and it's very simplified uh, in many ways. Next slide. Thank you, Helen. Um, so we will now shift gears to look at the data that sits at uh, within the SDG gender index. As we mentioned, um, it is one of the most comprehensive index uh, that exists on gender equality that's aligned to the SDGs. The SDG gender index lives on the Gender Advocates Data Hub. Um, the URL for that is data.em2030.org. We will add that in the chat uh, box as well. Um, what we have here is, um, is a screenshot uh, of one of the visualizations. Um, on the hub, you're able to see the index data visualized in a number of different ways. One interesting way to look at it is the overall index rankings um, and scores and scores by goals. So this particular visual provides that. Um, the index has a scoring mechanism. So each country in the index receive, receives an overall index score and an individual goal score based on a scale of zero to 100. Um, zero sort of ranging to the, um, to the lower and the poorer end, um, 100 towards um, a excellent end. A score of 100 reflects the achievement of the gender target uh, based on three to five indicators per goal. A score of 50, for instance, uh, signifies that a country is about halfway to meeting an indicator or a goal target. So um, the index essentially gives all countries a score from zero to 100 on their performance for each indicator 
for each SDG goal and um, their overall performance across SDGs. So as you see um, in this specific visual, there are um, to the left, there is there are the list of countries that are mentioned. Um, to the right of that list is the index score um, and sort of the, uh, the different verticals uh, on here and the, the way they're color coded sort of signify that the scores in red and orange uh, and yellow are tending towards um, sort of low performing um, uh, uh, indications, while the uh, the ones in green and blue are showing high performing indications, um, you'd see that for each country, um, there are there are sort of there are goals where um, where the performance is is higher versus there are goals where the performance is um, in, so, in in sort of the yellow, the orange, and the and the um, the red radar. Um, so what this visual here shows you um, is um, is a range of things, including the overall rank, the index score. Um, and the score for each goal and for each country. Uh, what you can also do at uh, the data hub, um, uh, once you um, go to the hub, uh, Anuja, can you move to the next slide? Thank you. Is uh, you can go ahead and filter that particular visual by region. Um, so it allows you to pick a region. Um, so for this particular visual, I picked um, the Asia Pacific region as a filter here. Um, I scroll down to pick the country that, um, that I'm working um, uh, around advocating uh, with respect to the SDGs, which is India. Um, and as an advocate, I was interested in knowing about uh, India's performance with respect to gender equality um, on the specific SDG related to gender equality. And I can move along um, to see the score for that particular SDG. And it, um, and it gives me a, um, a sort of a, a great snapshot and a great picture on uh, India's performance and, and a starting point and a great, uh, a, a great data visualization to add and use in my advocacy. Um, these visuals on the hub uh, can also be downloaded, so they can be used as it is and added to presentations, briefs, and any kind of tools that um, uh, that could benefit uh, with visuals. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Over to you, Helen. Yeah, I'm picking up from there, just using an example of Kenya as a country and uh, from the filters that... Uh, um, uh, that Arushi was talking about. If we take these, uh, the, the separate, the different goals and indicator scores by country, you get a summary like this for the country that you'll have chosen and picked out. And uh, if you are able to, to hover around uh, this, um, these areas, like where you see 52, for, for SDG one on, on poverty, you see that the country, for example, uh, scored 52. Um, I, I, I would like to speak specifically to that from that um, diagram that you see, Kenya uh, received an overall ranking at the global level of 97% uh, in terms of performing out of the 129 countries. And when you compare Kenya within Africa region with other countries, uh, the, the regional rank for Kenya was eight, and the overall uh, index score for all the goals was 55. Uh, that means the country is, is getting halfway into, into the, the, the expected performance. Uh, from, from this chart, you can also deduce um, uh, things like the, what were the strongest goals that Kenya, for example, was performing. So the highest goals scores that Kenya got were on sustainable development, SDG 2 on hunger and nutrition, SDG 8 on work and economic growth, and SDG 3 on health. And, and this was, of course, before COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, struck. So, But we can also see from this score still that uh, the weakest goals that Kenya was performing lowest um, where SDG 13 on climate uh, and justice, SDG 17 on partnership, and SDG 9 industry infrastructure and innovation. Of course, all these scores are likely to be changing based on uh, the performance. Uh, like now, after COVID 19 pandemic, a lot of a lot has changed. If we if we just look at SDG 4 as an example on on what is showing on that chart, the 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 there. If we were on live um, on on the on the the hub, we'd be able to pick, for example, the indicators for education, and we'd be able to see that some of the indicators 
I would have included the percentage of female students who are enrolled in primary education, for example, uh, the percentage of young women who age five, you know, years and above who are in upper secondary school graduating and completing education, the percentage of young women who are not in education, employment or training. And it will also give us the overall literature, I mean, literacy rates among adults, uh, especially for women. And so the key findings, for example, uh, from the region reveal very low, you know, uh, performance in for the countries falling behind average. So live on, on, on the website, you can be able to see and move around each of these. For example, you can see SDG 6 on water and sanitation. When you, when you move around there, it shows you the indicators and the scores. Over to you, um, Ceci. Uh, thank you. Uh, just before I jump into this uh, slide, I would just like to advise people joining us if you can access the full screen uh, so you can uh, visualize the slides a bit better. Um, yeah, so now I will talk about another exciting tool that Equal Measures 2030 launched last year. Um, so far, we've been talking about the SDG Gender Index, which is a very comprehensive tool uh, that looks at 51 indicators across 14 of the 17 SDGs. However, uh, this first uh, very comprehensive index only shows a snapshot of the current context of gender equality in these issues. So what EM2030 did uh, in 2020 was to create uh, this uh, tool to understand progress or even if countries were moving backwards in five uh, key gender equality issues. So the bending the curve towards gender equality report looks at these trends in the past 10 to 20 years uh, for these 129 countries in five key gender equality issues. Um, unfortunately, because of the no policy logo, we cannot do a live demonstration of the tool, but we encourage you to go to, this, to the website and maybe explore it while we present this. Uh, so in the, in the data hub, when you go to this 2020 index projections, which, show the, which, which shows the results uh, of the Vending the Curve report, um, you again will be able to find your country, to select your country, and then go through the results and the, ten, and the trends uh, of the past 10 to 20 years of these uh, five indicators. Access to mother family contraception, uh, girls secondary education, um, women's representations in ministerial positions, equality at the workplace, and also women's perception of safety. These are the five issues that the Bending the Curve report, uh, looks at and, and reports. So when you go into the data hub and, and you explore these, um, you will be able to see these past trends and also what are the projections based on um, the results and the, and, this, and, the, and the indicators and the values of those indicators that each country shows for each of the five issues that I just mentioned. So here we cannot do it, but when you go to the to the data hub and if you hover over the, you know, like these dots, for example, we're looking at Colombia's uh, example of access to modern family planning, uh, we will see that they have been um, uh, there has been quite a stable progress in this particular indicator. However, if we see the projections for Colombia, we see that by 2030, they will still not be in this position or they won't be reaching uh, the goal. Um, and in terms of advocacy, this is helpful to see uh, for advocates, researchers, uh, for the media to really look into the details and uh, to see, I mean, even if Colombia has been performing relatively well uh, throughout the past 10 to 20 years, what needs to be done to accelerate that progress and make sure that Colombia reaches this, um, this goal by 2030. So these are the kind of examples that you will find in this, uh, in this section of the data hub. As I said, this particular tool actually let us um, assess progress uh, for countries in each of these five uh, key indicators. Um, so now we will talk a bit about the examples that we have.
So I'm going to share examples from Africa uh, as a region, and um, this is based, based on uh, the work that um, uh, civil society organizations have been engaged with in terms of, so uh, led by the African Women's Development and Communication Network, FEMNET. Um, we have used the the index and all the data that is available on the platform uh, to one, uh, build capacity um, of um, advocates, um, media and um, policy makers on what we call the data-driven advocacy. So we conducted trainings of civil society organizations and networks who are interested in deepening and strengthening advocacy messages, giving more evidence to their messages in making them more compelling for the policy makers to listen and, and to take uh, the, the recommendations that we are making. Uh, so we've conducted trainings, just building that capacity and, and it works very well. The second way we have used uh, this data and, and, the, the, dash, and the, the index is um, as pattern raisers, for example, where, where we have a policy dialogue, um, we have used uh, we have made presentations of, us, of how a country is performing. Uh, take an example of Kenya, where we've had dialogues, we have had conversations, uh, national uh, SDG conferences uh, with policymakers, with private sector and multi-stakeholders. So we present this data at the beginning of a, a panel discussion, just to, to, as a teaser to show what is the current status and what, where do we need to pay attention to and which issues um, do we need to draw attention of the policymakers within the country. We have also done this um, uh, at, at, at our engagements um, with national civil society uh, when we are doing the voluntary national review processes um, within the country. And this usually contributes to the uh, Africa Regional Forum on Sustainable Development, which reviews the performance of, uh, of countries at the Africa regional level against the set targets. So annually, when we go to do the performance review um, with the African Union and UNECA, we, we use this data to engage in that process. Also at the high level political forum um, for sustainable development in July. So it's really a flexible information that you can use. We also use this data to track progress against other uh, regional and global commitments that our governments have made um, to, towards promoting gender equality. An example here, uh, we, we, in 2019, we started the review of the Beijing Plus 25 commitments uh, in, in, the, in the platform of action. And at regional level within the continent, um, FEMNET was leading and convening uh, the CSO parallel report uh, that was submitted to the UN alongside the AU uh, parallel report. So a lot of this data was, was used um, as to enrich the report uh, that governments were also producing and then also the civil society parallel report. So it's really a flexible, uh, amount of data that's available that is easily accessible, is usable, it's visualized, you can revisualize it in your own way and use it in various ways. I hand it back to you, Anita. Thank you, Helen. Now I will share a bit about of what have we done, uh, what had, has CLADEM done in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean using these tools. Um, so when CLADEM first joined this partnership uh, and looking at the, at the SDG Gender Index and the Data Hub, um, we knew it was important to uh, bring this information and this data closer to the advocates at the national level, at the local level, uh, that you know that for our region, usually the language barriers um, are a huge challenge when it comes to not only using data, but also the data tools that are out there. So the first step uh, in, uh, for CLADEM was to really bring this data closer. So what we did uh, back in 2019 was uh, to produce a seri series of country fact sheets um, 
to uh, do this zooming in the 15 countries uh, where Clatum works uh, to show this uh, results uh, based on the SDG gender index to show which goals um, were performing better, which ones were not, and which indicators were really uh, falling behind for, for, the, for these 15 countries in Latin America. So that was the first step uh, for us to really bring these advocates closer to this, uh, to this comprehensive tool. But throughout the past uh, two years, uh, we have also continued to use the tool in different advocacy efforts. Another example, and, and, and Helen was already talking about it, is, is uh, to produce advocacy messaging using uh, the data and using the results around key uh, global or regional advocacy moments, for example, the high level political forum. We have also used the data to produce uh, communications pieces. So for example, op-eds, that we uh, have also uh, written in collaboration with our national partners uh, in, in, in Latin America, for example. We did uh, an op-ed with uh, La Ruta Pacifica de las Mujeres, which is an organization um, working around the peace process in Colombia uh, from a women's and girls' rights perspective. Um, and I would, I would just like to use most of my time talking about the examples in Latin America, focused on bending the curve towards gender equality. I already talked about this other tool that EM2030 launched last year. So what we did is um, we replicated that exercise, but looking at the trends and projections for the 21 countries uh, in Latin America that are included in the index. So we did our regional version of the Bending the Curbs Toward Gender Equality Report. And one of the main conclusions that this uh, report um, uh, shows is that none of these uh, 21 Latin American countries included in the index will achieve the five gender equality uh, targets um, by 2030. And this in itself is a very powerful message because this shows us the need to really accelerate progress on these key issues, access to modern contraception, women's representation in ministerial positions, women's safety, um, gender equality uh, laws and policies in the workplace. Um, and this, this tool, for example, also uh, gave us opportunity not only to look at the at the regional big picture, but also dig into the details and to see which countries are have actually made big progress in the past 10 to 20 years in key gender equality issues. And despite the fact that some countries are still behind um, as to, you know, like 2019, 2020, uh, we were able to see uh, countries that were progressing really fast in, in key issues. Um, this tool also um, showed us, for example, that in Latin America, in terms of uh, workplace equality, equal pay and uh, paid maternity leave are two um, standards that are falling behind. So this is just to give you an example of how advocates can use these tools, also researchers, the media, uh, students, uh, pretty much everyone in, in their work to advance not only gender equality, but also the SDGs. And finally, uh, CLADEM has also focused on capacity development. Uh, we understand that um, building our capacity to use data uh, in our work, whether it is advocacy, research, uh, you know, developing policies, uh, et cetera, uh, needs uh, to um, shows the need to create these uh, spaces where advocates and, and, and different uh, stakeholders can access uh, these and, and where we can provide the tools to use this in the most effective way. Um, so in the past year, um, CLADEM also started conducting a series of capacity development workshops around the SDG Gender Index and the Bending the Curve report. We're planning to continue to do that in 2021. Um, of course, uh, most of these uh, sessions and workshops, we conduct them in, in Spanish. So we have Spanish speakers in the audience that will eventually <laughs> be interested in joining these uh, this spaces. Uh, we will 
be um, glad to have you. So this is just to mention a few examples of how uh, how have advocates in the LAC region have approached the uh, EM2030 tools, the index, and then the curve, which are the two um, yeah tools that we are uh, sharing with you today. Thank you so much, Sasi. Um, we hope that um, Helen and Sasi share out has given you um, on a sense of how the Equal Measures 2030 Gender Index and the Bending the Curve uh, uh, analysis serves as um, really effective tools in uh, in being in integrating um, in their in your advocacy and the, those kind of data visualizations and data points can be used effectively uh, to amplify um, your advocacy objective. Uh, we will move on now to answering a couple of um, questions. Um, Helen, I believe there is one question that um, you have offered to answer live, which is um, why Sudan and South Sudan has uh, not been covered as a part of the index. Would you like to go ahead and answer that? Yes, um, so in regard to uh, the, the SDGs that have not been covered and um, the countries that were not covered, uh, during the compilation of the index, uh, we, we had to look at um, all the 17 goals and look at which data is available. So, and, and we needed to be able to compare all the countries against the indicators, against the available data. So one of the biggest challenges was that uh, for some in, for some uh, goals, um, we, the, we didn't have data that speaks to the gender indicators. Um, it means that without data, you can't compare that country's performance to any other because we needed to compare all the countries against each other. So one of the biggest challenges has been lack of data. And because we, we are looking at official data, which is uh, provided by the National Bureaus of Statistics and offices uh, that they submit and also other data from other credible institutions. We, we had to eliminate some countries and eliminate, leave out some goals where there is not sufficient data across. The other bit to note is that the, the timeline, so usually the data is compared within a period of 10 years, 15 years, or five years. So if within that period of time, the, the, there's no data for that sustainable development goal and for those indicators, it's not possible to include uh, that goal and those indicators within, within the, the index. So we hope that um, as we, we move on uh, in 2022, we'll be producing another index. We hope that by that time, all the countries, the 190 something countries of the UN uh, will be having some data and adequate data to be compared across the board. And on the basis of that, because we are comparing progress, how our country is performing uh, based on the commitments that they made and within, within the, the sustainable development goals. Because the indicators are cutting and countries have also uh, prioritized some indicators. Some countries have left out some indicators. So we, 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 are look, we have that kind of challenge where if a country has not prioritized a particular indicator, you cannot uh, measure their performance. So those are the kind of challenges and that explains why some countries were left out and why some indicators were left out and some goals. But it's our hope that in the next index, most countries or if not all will have um, some data that is useful enough to be compared and compiled. Thanks, Helen. Um, there's a question on um, how this framework can be used um, in a local and a subnational level. And there's a reference to Latin America there, Sasi. Would you like to answer how, um, how some of our national partners have uh, contextualized uh, these tools and the framework? Yes, uh, thank you, Rishi. And I will also link that to this other question that asks about the, the lack of data in, in Latin American countries, that we are not covering all the, all the Latin American countries. 
Um, yeah, so so I can I can again go back to the example of our national partner in in Colombia. It is definitely a challenge when we are looking only at national level indicators or data. Uh, and then in terms of advocacy, one of the uh, most important messages from both uh, you know, our regional and national partners is to have uh, quality data at the local and subnational level. So, for example, our our national partner in Colombia, La Ruta Pacifica, that it, who, who are working around the peace process in Colombia, um, have uh, done some diagnosis, for example, in the past years around the Colombian election that happened recently, they uh, replicated some of these exercises. They were looking at some of these issues at the local and subnational level. So they were with um, grassroots uh, organizations and, and, and women in the, in the different uh, provinces where they work. And they collected the data at the, at the local level uh, to shape their proposals for the people that were running for office. So they were able to use this information after they went through a um, training on data-driven advocacy. Um, they collected the data, they uh, shaped their proposals, they presented these proposals to the, to the then candidates that were running for different uh, um, offices. And they uh, made sure that these, these candidates made commitments towards those issues that women were raising based on the data they collected at the local level. So this is, the, this is just an example of how um, women's rights organizations at the national and local level are using these tools to uh, bring data into their advocacy and to bridge that gap between the, nation, the national data and the local and subnational data, which we don't have enough of, right? So I, that's why I link this uh, this question to also Peter's question about uh, the, the the countries in Latin America that are not included in the SDG gender index and how can we change this? Something that we usually say um, in, in in this in this context uh, when working with data is that lack of data it's it's also um, it's also information, right? So we can um, we can say when, when we are advocating uh, around this is that if we don't have enough information, if the uh, statistic offices and the local governments are not collecting this data at the local level and are not making this data accessible for advocates, for researchers, for students, uh, then it is very difficult to track progress. So to answer this question, what can, what can we do to change this? We need to continue to advocate for uh, the decision makers, for the governments to collect this data and also to look at the data that is being um, produced by the community. Because we can not only look at data-driven advocacy from this very top-down perspective where we only have the data experts producing this data, we also need to look at what women's rights organizations are doing in their countries and their communities to uh, bridge these gaps in terms of the, of the data that is available avail, available out there. Thank you, um, Sasi. I believe there's also a question on data around violence against women. Um, the SDG gender index does cover a range of indicators uh, that refer to violence. Um, there are indicators on uh, child early enforced marriage, um, uh, perceptions around domestic violence. Uh, as Sassi mentioned, uh, um, the recently launched research Bending the Curve also has an indicator that looks at women's perception of safety. Um, so there are a range of indicators within the framework that offer data on violence. Um, and um, the Bending the Curve research specifically will offer trend data and will also, uh, will also um, give you the space to look at future projections. Um, so I would encourage you to go to the data hub um, and also look at the other list of indicators and um, explore through the hub um, the different visualizations that exist for um, data on violence. I, I think there's another question. I mean, there are many questions in the Q&A um, mm -hmm. chat box and also in the chat. So I identify a question around the indicators that are included in the ZG Gender Index if they're only based on the official SDG framework. 
uh, either Helen or Lucy would like to address that question about the indicators that are included in the SDG gender index. Yeah, sure. So the indicators are, um, there are a combination of the official uh, indicators in the SDG framework, as well as a range of complementary indicators. And as Helen mentioned, really the availability of um, uh, data and in many instances disaggregated data from credible uh, sources was um, a, a big filter in the process of identification of the indicators and since the SDG gender index aims to provide a more comprehensive picture on gender equality the hope was to also add um, uh, which is why a range of complementary indicators were added to provide uh, more perspective and insight in, um, in scenarios and domains where um, data from official um, sources was, um, or the official framework wasn't available. Helen, would you like to add? Yeah, I think um, for me, I would like to, to, to just say that um, at, at the subnational level, because there's also a question around um, how, how, how have we done this at the national and subnational level? Uh, I think for the indicators uh, at subnational level, uh, the, the institution that is interested in, for example, developing a framework like this and, and developing an index or a, a data dashboard would have to start by identifying the key issues that they want to focus on within the SDG framework and then look at which indicators within the SDG framework they want. But also in the event that some of the indicators you are interested in are not uh, within the framework, but you, you have data from other sources that you include that. So the first step for me is really prioritizing the issues and prioritizing the indicators that you'd like. But also looking at uh, uh, the sources of data is very, very important, which credible sources of data you're going to use. An example from Kenya with, with our partner, uh, Groot Kenya, has been able to put together, they identified the key issues that are very, very relevant to the women uh, at, at the county level, and they identified which indicators they would want to compile data on and measure progress over time. And they, they were able to actually find also the sources of this data. And one of the biggest sources of data, apart from the data that we have in the index, is the national statistics uh, from the Bureau of Statistics. And they have worked together with the Bureau of Statistics to access this data. They've been able to simplify it and, and put it together into a very comprehensive gender data and statistical dashboard that captures the key issues and the indicators and, and the, the, the progress against you know, the data that they have put together. So definitely it's very practical and what you need to do is that clarity and where the source of data and how credible the data is. Back to you. Thanks, Helen. Um, there's also a question on um, the ranking system and um, the calculations in the index. So the, uh, the gender index overall score is it's actually made up of the average of all 51 of the indicator, indicators which uh, comprise of the index. So each SDG score is made up of an average of the indicators for that goal. So each of the indicators is scored on a scale of zero to 100, where 100 uh, means meeting the target. Um, and the next, um, so that's sort of the, uh, the mechanism that is followed um, to determine the, the score and the rank um, within the index. I would like to address the question because there have been a few comments uh, that mention other indices and, and other data tools that are out there. Uh, and, and, and something that we get asked very often is kind of the difference between the SDG gender index and these other tools that are out there. Um, so, I mean, this, even though we do acknowledge that there are other tools uh, that look at the SDGs and gender equality, um, at the moment, there is no other tool that compiles this, uh, you know, number of indicators uh, with gender related data across the SDGs. So this is uh, what uh, makes this index unique and relevant. Some, something else that we didn't mention at the beginning is that the issues that the, um, that, they, that the index covers are not only based on the available data across these 
129 countries, but also based on, on, on what gender advocates um, have uh, said in terms of the priority issues uh, that uh, they work on. So there was uh, this survey that EM2030 uh, did in between the uh, development or of, of, of its uh, pilot index and the 2019 index, which is very comprehensive. Uh, so we, I mean, we also look at, at these priority issues that were mentioned by, by these advocates. And as uh, Arushi already mentioned, I mean, we collect data from different sources. Um, and, and this is what we, uh, we, we believe makes this, this particular tool unique and relevant and complementary to these other tools that exist out there. And uh, I also want to um, uh, mention something that uh, a participant wrote in the, in the Q&A chat box about the data gaps, that you realize that there is this data gap section within the data hub. Uh, and that's also important for us uh, from a research perspective, and, but also from an advocacy perspective, the way in, we, in which we expect uh, other people uh, to help us bridge those gaps is by raising awareness that, that these gaps exist. And then if there are researchers out there, and, and we saw that a lot of participants in this workshop are working this field, just to push for those, uh, you know, for this research, for these uh, data to be created, collected, uh, and then made accessible for advocates around the world. So, so yeah, thank you for uh, um, bringing that up, that there is a section on data gaps in the data hub, uh, which we also encourage you to look at. Um, yeah. Um, I would like to address uh, one comment that is in the chat that talks about um, uh, the, the fact that local government um, is reluctant to collect data and they see it as extra work for them and what strategies can we deploy to encourage them to collect relevant data? I, I think the starting point is, to, is to, to present the data that you have in the most comprehensive way and, and compelling way, uh, learning examples from what we are sharing. And from that, you can pick a conversation around what we call the citizen-generated data protocols. Um, most, most local governments, uh, their data is not considered official data by the National Bureau of Statistics, so it's not, it's, it's not valid, it's not, it's not, you know, it cannot be used as official data. And because of that, they are, they are, they are less motivated to collect the data. So the conversation at national level needs to happen between the National Bureau of Statistics and the offices at, at, at local level to have a conversation around how can we make the data that is collected at local government level, official data. And one way we have, we have done that in Kenya is, is through a conversation of, of developing national guidelines for, um, for other stakeholders, not necessarily beyond the statistics and uh, offices to be able to collect data. So once you have a national framework that guides um, collection of data that guides um, the principles of, 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 of authenticating data, it will give a, a push, a bigger push in terms of motivation for other institutions. But also, it gives, um, a, 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 it, it provides space for other uh, actors like civil society who collect a lot of data that is not considered official to be able to collect this data using that kind of guideline that and then government can recognize it. So those kind of conversations need to happen at that level. And, and, and on the basis of that, then the governments can, can co-develop those kind of, of guidelines together. And also you, you discuss strategies on how you can roll out, you know, some of those uh, uh, strategies and how you can roll out some of those guidelines and test them in a few pilot, you know, uh, counties um, at a time. As, as examples to be shared as best practice for a particular country. And I think that would speak very well with the target in the SDG 17, which talks about open data uh, for, for, you know, from governments, but also how governments are accepting uh, other data from, from other sources as authentic. Back to you. 
So I realize that we have five minutes left. I maybe we want just to make a quick comment around COVID-19 and the impact on girls and women's rights before we move on to the last <laughs> slide. I, I think it's important to also acknowledge the context we're living in at the moment. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's this question about, you know, the, the, the data on COVID being collected and when we will be able to see that. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, there's no right answer, I guess, to that because uh, what we've seen in the past year is that um, this is also a challenge. It has also become a challenge, really uh, making sure that we have uh, enough data available on the impact of COVID. And it, this will definitely be uh, in, the, in, the, in the mind and in the work that um, EM2030 and its partners uh, continue to do, uh, but it's, I mean, it's not an easy question and definitely we can have a, <laughs> you know, another workshop around this, but uh, yeah, thank you for raising that. I don't know if you want to add something, Arushi or Helen, on COVID. Yeah, I know, uh, just to echo what you said, Sasi, uh, I know it's, um, it's, it, it is a domain uh, that's of interest to all of us working around the SDGs and gender equality, and we're hearing um, a lot of narratives and uh, from from the ground at sort of local and national levels of um, uh, around uh, concerns around progress around gender equality. But I think the the tool, the index and the bending the curve projections in itself offer sort of a great starting point um, to this as well, because it they do give a sense of um, the accelerated need of progress even before um, COVID struck. So it, they do sort of point to key gaps and key areas of investment um, and serve as great ways that can support um, advocacy efforts, um, even um, around COVID and even sort of support conversations that we hope to have at, um, at a local, national and regional level um, around data for COVID um, and to get uh, to understand a bit more about the impact that COVID is having on, uh, on progress. Helen, would you like to add something? Um, I think from my end, it's more to encourage um, all of us to, to, to recognize that we, there's a lot of data out there. And I think um, what, what matters most is how accessible is this data and how credible is it? And what are the sources of this data? Um, it's, it's definitely like for Africa, we have the Africa CDC center that compiles all the data across the continent for all the countries. So again, it goes back to how governments are capturing the data and what they are submitting into the, into the center, you know, the disease control center. But also uh, we have a lot of initiatives by civil society organizations, by private sector, by UN, that having platforms that are continuously collecting data um, around what is happening, especially how the, the COVID-19 is impacting women and, and, and girls and all the gender. Uh, categories of, that are vulnerable. So I think we need to, to be able to look forward and say, when we do the next index, what would it look like, you know, in 2022, starting to already think and project around that. Um, I think it, it, it's definitely going to be different. The story will be different. The narrative will definitely be different. And picking from now, it means we are already changing our narrative around the impact of COVID on this, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Um, I believe we just have a minute uh, until we're um, at time. I just wanted to thank you so much for all the questions. We hope we were able to answer um, uh, all of your concerns and doubts. Um, we hope that the session has uh, been useful and helpful for you to build your capacity around gender data. And we also hope that you would explore the Gender Advocates Data Hub after today and use some of the visualizations and the data available in your advocacy and messaging. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank, you thank you, everyone. We, ask, we encourage you to fill out the, if, if there's a, a form, there's a link that the organizing team has pasted on the chat, uh, just to hear your feedback on, on the whole festival. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Bye thank guys. Thank you so much, everybody.